we've now gotten to a point where we can come back to the momentum principle and think about it in a little bit different form, a form which is possibly a more fundamental form than, than the way we've written it. Because it says, it's, it says something about what we know has to happen under any circumstances with any two interacting, any, any object interacting with the surroundings. And the basic idea is to think about momentum flowing between a system and its surroundings. It turns out you can't get rid of momentum. It's, it's sort of sticky. It's like being it in tag. What you can do is transfer it to something else or, uh, or add some other momentum to it. So, so one of the things we can do is think about interactions between system and surroundings. So... Here, here are two identical carts. They have, each have a mass about half a kilogram. We're going to call this cart 1. That's the system. We're going to call this cart 2. That's part of the surroundings. Now, it turns out that this whole system and surroundings thing is very important to be clear on what we're calling the system, what we're calling the surroundings. But we get to choose. This is a choice we make in analyzing a problem. And we'll see by the end of class that we can, we can make more than one choice and we can still get the same answer. But here's cart one. That's the system. There's cart two. That's the surroundings. I'm going to start cart one out with some initial momentum. What happened to its momentum? It transferred it to the surroundings, didn't it? And now let's let's do it again. Does it look about the question is, does the momentum look about the same? Masses of the carts are the same, so pretty much we can tell if the momentum's same. If they're going about the same speed, their momentum should be about the same, right? So Whoa, well that won't work. Go straight. About the same speed. If we measure, we could measure it precisely, but it looks like all the momentum that cart one had got transferred to the surroundings. So we can actually write the momentum principle in the form that's sometimes called conservation of momentum. And we can write that as the change in the momentum of a system plus the change in the momentum of the surroundings has to equal zero. So in this interaction, the momentum of our system changed from something to zero, but the momentum of the surroundings changed from zero to something. So in fact, that, that seems to have worked. Um, and that's, that turns out to be a fairly fundamental way of, um, of thinking about momentum transfer. So let's see if we can think about it for a different system. Now here we, we draw, so we drop a tennis ball. And... We start observing it at some time. We observe it for a second. And during this time, the tennis ball is going in the minus y direction, speeding up. So the delta P sub y is minus 0.6 kilogram meters per second. Now, presumably, the object in the surroundings that it's interacting with most strongly is the Earth. And so the question is, what is, according to the momentum principle, written as conservation of momentum here, what is the change in the Earth's momentum? Does it hit the Earth? No, it hasn't. It doesn't hit the Earth. It's just, it's just falling during this second, speeding up, but it hasn't hit the Earth yet. No, no collisions yet. Well, there's other stuff in the surroundings, but the Earth is surely the major thing, isn't it? Isn't that the most important piece of the surroundings? 
That's true, but does it interact with the Earth? How does it interact with the Earth? Though what through what kind of force? There we go, gravitational force, just that one that we've been exploring. Well, talk about it. Talk about it. What's going on here? Okay, so um, we have 70% saying that the change is plus 6 kilogram meters per second and 24% saying zero because the ball doesn't exert a force on the Earth. So let's, let's draw a picture and see what we think here. So here's the tennis ball. Here's the Earth, not drawn exactly to scale. Okay, we all agree that the Earth exerts a gravitational force on the tennis ball in the minus y direction, presumably, right? And that force is equal to g times the mass of the tennis ball times the mass of the Earth divided by more or less the radius of the Earth squared minus r hat, right? And remember that this approximate form we've been using, uh, the m little g thing, that, that piece turns out to be little g. Okay, that's a gravitational force. Well, does the gravitational force have the property of reciprocity? Oh, yeah, it does, doesn't it? So it looks like is the Earth going to feel a force due to the tennis ball? Is it equal and opposite? Yeah, it is. It is, isn't it? It's going to have the same... Magnitude, so they're interacting, and so we could say, well, the change in the momentum of the tennis ball is F gravitational due to the Earth times delta T. We could also say that the change in the momentum of the Earth is equal to F gravitational due to the ball, delta T. And we know these things are equal and opposite, so therefore those two things better be equal and opposite, which would make this be true, wouldn't it? Now, we've all dropped tennis balls. Well, we haven't, they bounce, but we're before they bounce, why haven't you observed changes in the momentum of the Earth? Are you just unobservant? The Earth is very massive, isn't it? In fact, the so the the mass so we have the mass of the tennis ball is I don't know what is it 50 50 grams 60 grams or something like that a tennis ball so. Uh, 0.06 kilograms times whatever its final speed is, a few meters per second, let's say, which is going to be equal in magnitude to, if they, you assume they both start from rest, so they're both speeding up toward each other, the magnitude of the momentum of the Earth which is, well, what's the mass of the Earth? It's 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. So what's the speed of the Earth going to be? Really? Really, really, really slow, isn't it? So... 10 to the minus 24 meters per second or something like that. We wouldn't observe it, just not, just not observable. But every time you drop a ball, you're exerting, you're affecting the momentum of the Earth. You're changing the momentum of the Earth. It's just that it's so massive that we don't, we don't see it happen very easily. Other comments about this? 
Well, in our question here, it fell for a second. So we had to observe. I mean, anytime you've got a delta, you've got to observe a change, and that means that there was some initial time and some final time, right? And so here we said we observe it for a second. And we're doing this physics thing, okay? I mean, you, you keep wanting to know reasonably, well, you know, what, where did you drop it from? Does it bounce? We're only looking at it in the time in between when my hand leaves it and before it gets to the ground. So we can choose our delta t to be anything we want. We're observing it from that period. And remember that this is all okay because the momentum at the instant we start to look at this thing has its entire history added up into it. So the fact that I picked it up off the table and held it up here and it was at rest and re interacting with my hand and then I released it and it fell, all that's added up into the momentum it has at the moment we start observing when it gets right there. So that's not a problem. Now there's two different things we could do here. We could consider we didn't really say what the system and what the surroundings is. So we could say, well, the tennis ball is the system and the earth is the surroundings. We were having a conversation about that. We could also say, well, let's take both the tennis ball and the earth to be the system. System can have more than one object in it. So we have two objects in the system, at which point, there's not much in the surroundings that we're really going to care about. In which so, if there's nothing happening in the surroundings, that would be zero. And so would that. It would work out because delta PY for the Earth is negative. For the tennis ball is negative. Delta PY for the Earth is positive. They add up to zero. So we can do it either way. There's, some, there's often some advantages in terms of problem solving for taking more than one object to be the system. So we can also say here that if we have an isolated system, an isolated system means nothing significant in the surroundings. So for real, you could be way out in outer space, far from all other objects, um, and it would be very isolated. Or it could be the tennis ball plus the earth is an isolated system because not much is happening to that system during the, the, the period we're watching. And we say the momentum of an isolated system, isolated means basically no surroundings, doesn't change. So if we take the universe as the system, it surely doesn't have any surroundings. So the momentum of the universe must be constant, even though momentum is continually flowing from one object to another within our system. Nonetheless, the sum has to be the same. <coughs> 